higher education has been having increasing problems. They've had problems for years, but those problems have been growing in magnitude. Uh, one statistic that was already obvious when I was starting to write the book and is even more so now is that we have nearly two million fewer students going to college than we did in the year 2010. So uh, there is actually, uh, people are starting to say no to college. And of course the question is why? And well, tuition fees are obviously rising dramatically. Uh, that, that's slowed down a little bit in the last few years, but it, uh, uh, the affordability issue has grown uh, since my last book that I wrote on this uh, general topic way back in 2004. Uh, we have uh, a, a employability pr crisis of sorts. A lot of kids are getting degrees, but when they go out to get jobs, even in this hot labor market we're in right now, they get jobs. They're not unemployed, but they're often working at Starbucks or uh, baristas or they're working at Walmart or uh, Home Depot or some uh, store like that. And they're not getting jobs using the skills that are usually associated with a college degree. And lastly, I don't want to give you too long of an answer here, the last big problem is a learning problem. We don't think much about it. Are kids really learning a lot while in their college? Are they leaving with a lot more than they came in? Uh, learning in a way that would make them better citizens, would make them more uh, better productive workers, make them uh, more honest, uh, greater integrity. Uh, what is it they're getting out of college? Well, this is often very difficult to measure and very hard to measure. But what there's some little bit of evidence that says that maybe the learning is less than it should be. It's as bad as I thought, maybe marginally worse than I thought. Uh, and I, uh, well, I spent a year writing the book, but I've been uh, in the, well, I've been in the field of higher education for over 50 years. So it's a guy like me who's been around a long time that brings a perspective that perhaps is useful. To, uh, to the table. And the fact for the last 15 or 20 of those 50 years, I've been thinking and writing on higher ed issues. Before then, I was doing my work as an economic historian, writing books about American economic history and things like that, labor markets. And um, I thought I brought a perspective that uh, is not totally unique, but uh, is perhaps useful. And uh, so I've taken on all of these every dimension. And there are things we haven't mentioned, uh, Mitch. Uh, intercollegiate athletics would be an example of something that uh, gets a lot of attention. The, uh, a lot of people are talking about administrative bloat these days, that the universities are adding more and more administrators, people who don't actually teach or do research, but do something other than teaching and research. Uh, that is a problem. I talk about all these things in the book. I think the community, college community has been slow in recognizing the problem because they've been protected. They get money from state governments, they get money from private philanthropists, they get special tax breaks. They're protected. Uh, in the private economy, if you goof or make a mistake, you learn pretty quickly about it. And uh, we have, uh, the world is littered with former great corporations. Uh, uh, let me mention Eastman Kodak would be a good example. 25 years ago, Eastman Kodak was at the king of the heap. It was uh, one of America's leading corporations, uh, number one and easily in the photography area. It has gone through a bankruptcy. It barely exists today, uh, but its capitalization is trivial compared with most companies. And it essentially lost its way because it didn't foresee the new technology that was coming in and didn't rise to meet it or to take that technology over, become a commanding force. So they, they suffered dramatically. Uh, uh, that doesn't happen in higher ed. I don't know of a major university 
who's in, say, the top 25 or top 50 universities, however you measure it, pick any me method you want, uh, that didn't exist 50 years ago. I mean, they all they have the the list of the top 50 hasn't changed that much. A little bit here and there. Some schools have kind of inched up over the years. I suppose Stanford is inched up over the years, uh, uh, for example, and some have probably fallen a little bit. Uh, but but everything's stable because there's no consequences of failure uh, because there's someone in there to sort of subsidize you, and pick 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 things up. That, but that's not the way it is in the uh, uh, free market economy. And uh, so it's taken the higher ed community a while to realize what's going on. But now, that's what I just said is still true. A lot of very uh, uh, thinly endowed uh, schools, particularly private schools, get no state money, are finding that, well, we don't we can't make it anymore, and so some of them are starting to, clo uh, to close. To uh, the same with uh, sort of lower quality state universities. Uh, public support of higher ed is waning a little bit. Some state governments are saying, "Well, uh, we don't need to support higher ed that much more than we used to." So the uh, support isn't growing as robustly as it once was. People are kind of fed up with high tuition fees or the political uh, 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 distortions that go on in college campuses, political correctness, all that is another factor, particularly among the more conservative members of the community uh, and, and who are rightfully, I think rightfully, uh, concerned about these things. So we're starting to see some schools close. And uh, there were five schools in the state of Vermont, little dinky state of Vermont, that closed or announced they were, they were closing last year. And the, when that happens, uh, uh, the university presidents are getting very concerned. And so we're starting to see a little panic setting in. It's easier, <laughs> it's easy to criticize, it's, uh, it's hard. Uh, a lot of things that in a perfect world I, I could name a lot of things that should happen that probably won't happen because of the nature of the American political system. And uh, some might say it's uh, imperfections in our democratic process. I'm not a political scientist. I'll let others make that judgment. But there are some things that we could do. The single one thing that I think has been the biggest problem on the cost affordability front has been the federal student financial assistance programs that were put in uh, well I suppose you could say they started in 1944 with a GI bill but didn't really become much of a factor until the 70s the 1970s and in the last 40 years those have grown uh, enormously uh, led to high tuition fees uh, colleges have raised their fees to grab the money that is available to the, that they can borrow. This has uh, caused a lot of problems, including things like this administrative bloat I mentioned. All this has come about because of high tuition fees. It wouldn't have happened otherwise, I don't think. So uh, we got to do something about, about to change that environment. In a perfect world, we would phase out the federal student loans. They're private solutions to the problem well, uh, when you buy a car or buy a house you you don't go to the government to buy the house you go to someone else and you can do the same thing with college education we used to do it that way then even now a third uh, a, a third or so of people go to college even now don't borrow any money so we need to change that that would be where I would start I'm not that smart and uh, Adam Smith who wrote, wrote in the wealth of nations uh, the first great work in economics he he wrote that book uh, on the same year the same year the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, came about uh, 244 years ago 
uh, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations said, well, the teaching has gone downhill at Oxford these days because now uh, the professors are hired by the university and they're, they get their money no matter how good of teachers they are or not. It used to be the kids, uh, the students, gave their money to the professors who then uh, used the those money to feed themselves it was a revenue and maybe we need to go back to uh, you could call it an individual contractor model where professors contract with some central administration to provide their services but where most of the fee revenue goes to the professors and then, then they turn around and kick some money back to the central administration to rent buildings and pay for the library and the uh, uh, a few administrators that you really need. Uh, we have vastly too many administrators, but uh, uh, so no, we need to rethink the model. That, and that that that's an old, very old way of doing it. And some people look to things like online education and to electronics, and and the, there's some promise in the, in those areas. There's, uh, uh, but I think the the some of the old fashioned ideas like the one I just mentioned uh, also have a considerable uh, promise. Plato wasn't always right, but when he wrote the Republic, uh, whenever that was, 2,400 years ago, I, I'm really sounding old fashioned today. I'm talking about Adam Smith and Plato, but uh, uh, and one of my concerns is people don't read Adam Smith or Plato as much as they should. But Plato in the Republic, you know, said roughly, necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, that means uh, as more and more schools start to go bankrupt or are threatened with bankruptcy, they have to get creative. They have to think, well, maybe we can merge with our neighbor next door. Maybe we could have one library serve the two schools instead of having two libraries, instead of buying, each of us buying a book, a new book every year for the, this or that. We'll only buy one book for the two schools and we'll cut the uh, acquisition costs in half. Then someone else might say, well, why do we even need to buy books for libraries at all anymore in this day and age? No one goes to the library to take books out anymore. So we're going to rethink a lot of things that we do, uh, and more out of a sense of desperation and panic rather than uh, uh, anything else. But it's, it might work. It will lead, in some cases, to greater efficiency. Uh, people say, well, maybe people, why do we have kids sit go home for in the middle of May or some June 1st for three months. I mean, they're not helping p pick the crops anymore. Uh, do we really, couldn't we go around the clock, have school 12 months a year and get the kids out in three years instead of four, save a little money? You could even work it out so they could still do one internship in that period and get a little real world bis uh, real world experience and still get an education in three years instead of four why why are we doing these things well i think uh schools as things get more desperate they'll think ah oh, we're going to offer the three-year degree instead of the four-year degree we're going to use our buildings 12 months a year rather than eight or nine months a year and sort of things like that there's probably going to be quite a bit of change um but unlike some, I do think the traditional school will exist. People go to college for a multitude of reasons. They go for socialization. They go to, uh, for the same reason people join clubs. Uh, they go to uh, uh, make friends, uh, uh, to do things other than learn. Some of them spend too much time drinking or uh, doing drugs or other things but these are things that are part of the maturation uh, maturing process uh, the transition from adolescence to adulthood is more than just uh, book learning and so the the, the traditional liberal arts college or uh, uh, regional universities and even major state universities will I think will uh, exist 
30, 40 years from now. There may be, there will be some changes. There will be more role for online education and for not, uh, different ways of communicating. But people want to, to, to differentiate the best from the average and the mediocre. And the certification, the little piece of paper that we hand out, the diploma, uh, is probably not the most efficient way of doing it. We Kids spend $200,000 earning this little piece of paper. We'll probably find a cheaper way of doing it and a more efficient way, but we still need that certification. Kids still, the, the, the employers of the world want to know who is good and who is less good. And colleges do serve a useful role in determining that. And uh, that, I think, will probably still be true a generation from now. Harvard is not going to go bankrupt. If Harvard had closed tomorrow because they had no applications, they would still make $2 billion next year from endowment money. Uh, and that's true of many of the private. Duke is true. It's true at Duke. Uh, it may not be as true, say, at the University of North Carolina because it's more dependent on public funds. But uh, that's what's uh, so I see a uh, there will be a future for higher ed.